Hello, everyone. Dr. Yonit Arthur here. You are on The Steady Coach. One of the most important and difficult questions I get here on my channel is what do I work on in order to heal? How do I work on it? And how do I know I'm working on the right things? This looks different for everyone. And that is why I have an entire YouTube channel devoted to this topic. If you're new to my work, and you're new to the idea of neural circuit dizziness, the first place that you want to start is in your reactions to the sensations themselves, changing the fear response, doing things like somatic tracking, understanding that you're safe, and understanding that this is a brain prediction error. However, if you are familiar with my work and you've already worked on those things, you may be wondering what to do next. And that is what this interview is going to answer. This interview is all about transformational healing. And for many people with neural circuit dizziness, the way out of the symptoms, both making sure that they go away and making sure that you stay out of them for good, is actually through transformation and change. These are things I do talk about on my channel, but we're going to take a much deeper dive today than I ever have before. So I suggest you grab a notepad and something to write with. You're going to need it for this interview. Also, please stay tuned all the way till the end. I summarize the key takeaways from this interview at the very end. My very special guest today is Dave Jolly who is a hypnotherapist and transformational coach. Dave has worked with many different clients with many different needs in many different areas. Nowadays, he works in the psychedelic space, helping people who are undergoing psychedelic assisted therapy. In this interview, we talk all about transformational healing. We break it down for you in very concrete ways, and I guarantee you're going to walk away from this interview with something or more than one thing that you can implement right now to help you advance your healing journey. Please enjoy this interview, and as always, if you enjoyed this content, please like the video, please share please subscribe to my channel. Or if you're listening to this as a podcast, please consider leaving me a five-star review or following or subscribing to the podcast. And also, please join the conversation on YouTube. We're going to have a whole interesting conversation about this one, guys. So leave a question and comment. I look forward to talking all this through with you. Enjoy. This is a good one. Hey, Dave. Hey, Yoni. Hey. I am so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to come on. My pleasure. It is a major privilege to have you here because I think you are going to give my audience a perspective on things that they haven't heard before. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to get into the meat of it. But before I start asking you all sorts of in-depth questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one of my first questions, just so everyone knows, I sent Dave some questions in advance. And my first one was, here, let's start with an easy one. What is healing? <laughs> so <laughs> before we get into those, though, Dave, would you mind just sharing a little bit about how you learned how to heal, how you learned about transformation? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm kind of an anomaly. Well, not not totally, but I'm I'm kind of the opposite of how a lot of people learn this, which is that I started um, exploring psychedelics, which ended up with me then exploring uh, consciousness and spirituality. And what I didn't realize at the time was that I was trying to self-heal. And I didn't really fully grok yet what needed to happen in order for me to feel the way I was wanted to feel, but I was really trying to feel a certain way. So that kind of slowly crept into um, getting into personal development. And then that slowly crept into studying coaching and neuro-linguistic programming, hypnosis, which I imagine we might talk about. And um, and so I've kind of bootstrapped this whole thing from really from raw life experience of I have these problems and I've had these profound moments and peak states and amazing life experiences. And I know I'm not functioning the way I want to function. And I know there's a better way to function and I don't know where the, the answers are. And so I kind of just, um, I'm very self 
educational. I'm, I'm very much an autodidact. So just like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. So that's really the process. So it's been this long, slow, meandering, cross-trained kind of approach to getting where I'm at. To engineering happiness, to engineering contentment. Well-being, I think for me yeah. is is really the the real thing I was probably seeking is like deep well-being in my nervous system. But yeah, you know, I mean, along the way, connecting the dots, you know, what is real lasting happiness? What is spir spiritual alignment as a, as a way of living? What is, um, what's a healthy adaptive way of relating in the world? What's a way of being myself? You know, a lot of these kind of, I would say kind of common issues that people have and common personal development questions that people have. Those were all kind of in the background too, you know? Okay. So, yeah. And I'm going to frame this for, for people listening, because I think I, I haven't always come out as um, directly and said this, but part of recovery from chronic dizziness is transformational change, period. Right. Recovery does not mean the symptoms just magically going away and you go back to the life that you had before. You are going to have to change to recover. Yeah. So that is why you're you're here, because mm -hmm. of of all the people that I've met, I think you have one of the most refreshing and just broad perspectives on what that even means and what that looks like. Mm. For context, though, if you could explain when you you ended up here, which is wonderful, but where were you before you found well-being? Yes. Okay. Well, how far how far back do we want to go, and and how do you <laughs> down the rabbit hole? Dysfunction? Do we want to? Uh, you know? How bad? Da wow. Okay. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe just the headlines. Maybe we'll okay. start with the headlines, and I'll and I'll poke okay. at them if, if I think we should go down those roads. Long story short, um, I did have some childhood trauma. Um, you know, come from a divorced family. Um, there was other stuff there that I didn't realize at the time was traumatic. Other dynamics and more subtle things, but there was a background of childhood trauma, um, and so that kind of loaded the plate in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. Um, then I kind of like a lot of 20 somethings we see today kind of, you know, spent a lot of my twenties kind of trying to figure myself out, felt ungrounded, unsure about what I want to do with my life. There's a lot of that kind of thing going on. Um, that stress and pressure over time added up to a lot of nervous system dysregulation. So that looked like, um, patterns of massive avoidance, procrastination, Anytime I get stressed, I would kind of collapse and freeze and numb out, which of course means that financial stress, solving life questions like what am I going to do with my life? What's my career path? Um, solving problems became really hard. So I was kind of in this loop for a long time, of, you know, which I, so many of my clients come to me with, which is why am I this way? How come I'm stuck with this problem? Um, what's really going on here and, and how do I fix it? And, um, and that really, that was most of my 20s and a good chunk of my 30s, if I'm going to be frank here. And so, um, yeah, so it was kind of this mix of external pressures, internal pressures, things that needed resolving that I didn't even know were there. Um, and that eventually even kind of in my mid 30s turned into kind of health issues a little bit too. And so that turned into like food sensitivities that turned into um, some panic attacks, anxiety attacks, things like that. So um, I've certainly done my rounds with um, feeling out of sorts, feeling um, lost, stressed, overwhelmed, ungrounded, dysregulated, hopeless, depressed, anxious, you name it. I've kind of dealt with a lot of that stuff personally. Yeah. I'm sorry that you went through that, but I'm celebrating because I'm I know where you're at now. Yeah. So I I would love for, to highlight though, I, I happen to know that one of the many issues that you had at this point mm -hmm. was dizziness. Yep. Yeah. Totally. So yep. tell me, tell me a little more about that. Yeah. Okay. Long story short, um, somewhere around 2016 ish, something like that. So not that long ago, really. Um, I was living in the Bay area, San Francisco Bay area. Um, and there's a lot of bridges. There's a lot of, you know, water and a lot of bridges connecting the different land structures there. Right. And so I would live in one place, but be working another place. So it meant driving over bridges, yada, yada. Long story short, I developed, um, 
kind of dizzy spells while I was driving that were probably connected A, to a bunch of stress I was going through and B, perhaps to a food sensitivity that I developed to coffee in particular, which was a bummer because I love coffee. Um, and and, and it basically would turn out I'd be driving over these bridges, big trucks, and I would get dizzy and overwhelmed and nauseous. And I'd be kind of terrified because I'd be driving alone and, you know, all kinds of weird visual distortions and the whole nine there. Um, and I didn't have the money or really even at that time, I wouldn't have even known who to go to, to sort that out. So at this point, I was already kind of studying neurolinguistic programming and coaching and working with the nervous system and how to make shifts at a somatic level. And so uh, I try to process on myself. And uh, lo and behold, it worked really quickly. I kind of lucked out with this particular thing. But um, yeah, I, I, was, I went from like probably 18 months of this pattern of dizziness while driving, which really sucks, especially when you're, when you have to drive two or three hours away to, for your gigs or whatever. Um, and, you know, probably within 10, 15 minutes, I had it sorted out. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Although I do want to just again, stress something that you said a few moments before you said you had it kicked, um, in 15 minutes, you were already looking at your nervous system, you were already studying how to work with your nervous system. So Correct. this wasn't like a, oh, I read this one cool trick online. And then boom, it just happened. You already had a, an inkling, at least probably more than an inkling that this mm -hmm. was a sign of, of nervous system dysregulation. This wasn't, mm -hmm. oh, there's something wrong with my inner ear. You, you already, it, you already knew that. Right. Yeah. I, I had a sense of that, um, you know, from all of my studies. So mm -hmm. And, and I already had a sense of how to work with myself, not only from the training, but also, of course, um, meditation practice. So I had a skill of self-observation and tracking what's going on in my body, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, I found this article and I'm going to do this thing and boom, I'm fixed. It, it really wasn't that simple. I had a lot of foundation already set up, like you're saying. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for, for helping me clarify that. Mm -hmm. So- just before, again, before we dive in, everyone's like, when is she going to get to the good, the good questions, the meaty questions? Um, I did want to also just frame for people the kinds of, of clients you've worked with, because you've mm -hmm. worked with a, a wide range of clients. Mm -hmm. And in particular, if you could say something about the level of dysregulation, distress, physical, mm -hmm. emotional symptoms people have had that you've mm -hmm. worked with. Yes, right. So I should probably clarify up front for everyone here. I'm not a licensed therapist. There is a limit to my scope of practice. Sometimes I get people who, uh, quite frankly, uh, the problem is a little more extreme than my capacity to help them. So sure. I try to be really self honest and likewise, really Dave. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. Not therapist I, either. Yeah. yeah, right. And I try yeah. to be really honest with my clients that that's the case too, mm -hmm. or any potential clients, and and send them up to the appropriate place. But mm -hmm. Um, it's a pretty wide range. I've helped people with things that are like, you know, yeah, I'm unhappy with my career. I want to pivot, right? I want to, I, I want to find the courage or the comfort to do that. Uh, all the way to people with c big capital T traumas that, you know, really need a lot of support. They need a lot of help around transforming that. Um, really everything in between. I've coached uh, people who have million dollar organizations and businesses underneath them. I've coached people who are public speakers who have terrible stage fright issues, for example, like mm -hmm. massive, massive dysregulations from stage fright. I've helped people who um, maybe were just a little underdeveloped, you know, who grew up with a lot of challenges in childhood. And there were a lot of things they their nervous system never got along the way that they need to kind of build in. So mm -hmm. it's really client to client, but I would say a lot of the people that I work with um, tend to lean towards the trauma side of things. They need a lot of support around early you know, childhood experiences that weren't great or a traumatic life event that needs cleaning up and they don't know how. Um, or a lot of them, quite frankly, have been to psychiatrists and therapists, talk therapy, sometimes for decades or you know years with not with either slow progress or no progress. And they're just like, they're so bummed out 
and then they find me one way or another, what I have to say seems to resonate or they feel like I'm actually paying attention. And then that's often the entry into working with those people. And this tees up a question that we're going to get to later um, mm -hmm. about what therapy tends to focus on is going, moving toward the problem. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. sometimes not to say that we shouldn't figure out what the problem is. So those mm -hmm. listening, I talk about problems a lot, <laughs> um, but it's also, it's equally important to, to, to get a really, really, really good sense of what is right. Like what is already okay. What is already working. Yeah. So there's this misconception, I think when we say stuff like your nervous system is in danger mode, you need to create safety. Mm -hmm. Creating safety doesn't necessarily mean drawing in safety from some outside source because you don't have it in you because there's something yeah. wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes safety is is just a matter of of being able to open the door to the resources that are already in exactly. side people. Yeah. And again, why again, I'm so excited to have this conversation because you're going to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we can get more into resources later if you like. Um, but but I would say really quick about resources and, and developing the the strength side of the equation here, the asset side of the equation is you know, it, resources can vary from something really huge and profound and dramatic, like this robust capacity for compassion or deep love or deep, you know, empowerment or something like that, all the way to something really subtle. You know, uh, a lot of my clients' resources are simply uh, uh, an attitude of curiosity, for example, or a little bit of a sense of humor, you know, yes. or, uh, things like this, you know, those can go a really long way towards healing. Thank you for saying that and and take some notes. Guys, get your get your notepads out now cuz again, I am going to be translating some of the things that you tell us Dave into sure. terms that my audience is going to be super familiar with. So, mm -hmm. messages of safety, again, it doesn't necessarily mean like a transcendent sense of, you know, oneness with the universe, although that's wonderful too. Absolutely. Um, it it can just mean seeing your sensation, seeing the symptoms with just even just neutrality mm -hmm. can be it can be a message of safety mm -hmm. and then moving from neutrality can we move towards just a little bit of curiosity or just a little bit of of openness mm -hmm. and and i we do that again frequently through an exercise we call somatic tracking which is a little different from somatic tracking is in many other fields but mm -hmm. we'll get there we'll get there so I guess now i i'm going to throw the one of the big questions at you the one i okay. referenced earlier so in your view, when regardless of symptoms, what does healing really mean? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, what does healing really mean? Um, yeah, small question, right? <laughs> You're so, welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with big questions like this, I like to think, I, I like to try to clarify it and really get more specific. So, I think one of the things to understand about healing that I think a lot of people kind of have misconceptions around is that it's a thing to consume or acquire, that it's a static thing that you're going to have someday, right? And I know this might sound a little pedantic, but I promise you there's, there's a reason I'm saying this, which is that it's really important to understand that healing is a process. It's, it's a moving skill and it's a skill, right? Healing is a thing we learn how to do that we, we can then repetitively do over and over. Um, I think, you know, if I was gonna like give the little one-liner and be kind of pithy about it, I might say healing is like homeostasis at an optimized level. Mm. Might be one way of thinking about it, right? So obviously problems are often homeostasis too, right? So you know, when we have a problem, it's like our nervous system is adapted to a dysfunctional balance, kind of, if that makes sense. Um, but I think with healing, you know, we've moved ourselves to a new homeostasis that's how we want it to be or closer to how we want it to be or, you know, more optimal. Um, I think, you know, another, but if, I, if I'm really going to get down to like, what is healing, right? Like, like, what is it really, you know? So it's a skill, it's a, it's an, it's a process, it's an ongoing thing, and it's the process of accessing our nervous system's kind of inherent capacity for uh, you know, self-organization, balance, 
um, harmony, um, uh, and really being in touch with, from my point of view, like the deeper um, self, you know, restoring capacity of the nervous self writing, the self writing yeah. capacity. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that means kind of in a certain sense, from my point of view, and this might be a little woo woo, kind of getting in touch with uh, the life force and the power of our life force underneath that, that creates that capacity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So the way, as you're describing it this way, I'm imagining that the, the dizziness, the symptoms, the anxiety, the, all, all the stuff that comes along with that, which are not small things, they're like the clouds, but the sky is still there. The Correct. sky is still there. Exactly. And um, I, I've said this again, maybe not in so many words, but that, the reason I'm here preaching to people on my YouTube channel about how they can get better is because the brain wants to get better. The nervous mm -hmm. system wants to, to, to self right. We just have to get out of its way. And that's the real challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well said. I think that's a lot of it right there is um, discovering. And I think it can be a process, especially at first of discovering that there is kind of a deeper sky, if you will, uh, of supportive life force there available. And then the question is, how do I get in touch with that? How do I kind of bring that in and let my system do what it knows how to do? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and there are two directions. It seems very, very simplistically, but there are mm -hmm. two directions that we can use to do this. And in, in conventional therapy, it's, let's solve the problems, the things that are holding you back. But what mm -hmm. you're describing is really the, the aim is to access this, this resource, this self-writing birthright that we, we all have, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, that's not necessarily the only way to get there. No, I right. very much agree with that. Um, sometimes we do need to grapple with the problem more directly. And sometimes um, that's a useful way of going, but that's not always the way to go. And sometimes that can actually be so daunting or so um, feel so disempowering that it's actually more useful to swing towards, you know, what is empowering, what is restorative, what is comforting, what is, you know, supportive first, you know? Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess all of the things that I'm about to ask you about are are going to be a little mixed. So there are going to be some things that fall into that latter category that we just talked about. And then some of the things we're going to talk about are really uh, addressing the problems, the clouds, right, to, to get them out of the way of the sky. Mm -hmm. um, but in your view, I mean, there are so many different approaches to healing. There are so many different components that go into it another huge question for you. So what are the kind of the fundamental must haves for someone to get better? Again, regardless of what kinds of symptoms? Good question. And, um, and just for full disclosure to let people in on how I see and, and think this about this process. Um, I'm always <laughs> like always tinkering and always thinking of, in terms of first principles about healing and change and transformation. So you know, and first principles thinking really is what, you know, what are the foundational assumptions that we're starting from that gets us a certain result? And are those foundations and assumptions correct and accurate? Or is there a simpler or different assumption or angle to start from? So let me pause you there. Yeah. Can you give a simple example of that? Um, well, sure. Just use what we were just saying with, um, with, you know, typical therapy, you know, with this kind of pathology model, the assumption is that the way to feel better is by looking at what's wrong and dealing with pathology, right? So it's this, it's, it's this go fix the problem as, as the fundamental assumption there, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, what if that's not the only way to get there? Or what if that's not the easiest way to get there or the best way to get there or the most uh, enduring way to get there, for example? Uh, what so about I'm, like something like a problem a client might have? Can you get a really simple, like I have this problem and and you 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 might help that person see it, it or at least question their assumptions? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My poor clients, I'm doing this to them all the time. I mean, you know, <laughs> and, and, and to be fair to them, uh, 
I, I teach them how to do this for themselves because I think it's a really important life tool, life skill. And so, um, yeah, let's say a client comes to me and they're like, I have depression, right? And they come from the kind of, uh, you know, status quo concept of depression is a deficiency of serotonin. Uh, I, you know, I've been taking SSRIs for it, but it hasn't been working. And, you know, and then they come to me and they're, and they want help with this kind of thing. Right now I might start with a lot of questions about obviously, well, a, is it a brain imbalance serotonin deficiency? Is that a, you know, correct conception of it? Um, you know, if the SSRIs aren't helping, you know, what else does that mean? Is there another place we need to go with your attention? Right. Um, I might look at, okay, you're calling it depression. Is there maybe another way to describe what you're experiencing that might be a little more accurate or a little more precise or clear, you know? So I'll start to unpack this experience and get down into, well, what's really here and what are other ways we can see this that might open up a new suggestion of a way to go in terms of healing or in terms of, of a change. So Thank yeah, you. That, that might be, an, does, is, does yeah. that clarify? Yep. That clarifies. Yeah. Thank Great. you. So again, it, it for, for folks listening and, and who are wondering, well, what does that have to do with dizziness? Um, it, it's kind of what we do when you have the diagnosis that you have. And then I say, you know, now that you have the diagnosis, what does the, like, what does the diagnosis tell you? It, mm. it doesn't really tell you anything. And, and you come here and you listen to all my content and you realize, that diagnosis is, is irrelevant. What I have is nervous system dysfunction that's leading to the symptoms and the symptoms aren't the primary problem anymore. Right. right. So it's a little bit of, it's similar to that. So, um, yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? I, I was just going to say, uh, this is a common thing amongst my clients too, a lot where, uh, they come in, you know, really bought into what's essentially, a, a, a description that's mm -hmm. very broad mm -hmm. and they don't really know what's happening for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if the assumption is I have anxiety, I have depression, and it's and that's just a description of symptoms, right? And and one of the major things I try to get people to see is symptoms are not the real problem here. Symptoms are the, the nervous Breach. system's reaction to whatever the real problem is. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. I feel very validated now. <laughs> um, okay. So I interrupted and cut you off and took us off. Um, so you were saying, I, I had asked you what the major kind of non-negotiables are for the mm -hmm. purposes of healing. And the mm -hmm. first thing you said was questioning people's assumptions or helping them kind of get a little more flexibility around their assumptions. Yes. Uh, and that's not always something I do directly with the client immediately. Um, sometimes that's just a mindset I'm holding in the background, which is you know, uh, some clients may not like to hear this exactly, but part of a coach's role is to not exactly, to have total compassion and connection and caring, but not buy into the view or the, the set of assumptions that they have, because if they're stuck with where to go, I, I need to have an outside view so that I can give them, give them another angle on this, right? So, yes. so I start with that, even though I don't always bring that to them right away. I might just honor what they're saying and where they're coming from and work with that. But in, my, in the back of my mind, I'm going, okay, what else is here? You know, what's another way of looking at this? But so yeah, that's foundational. Um, I would say in my experience, since I'm approaching this whole thing from this kind of first principles, you know, what's really at the foundation question, uh, I've arrived at safety being key, safety being crucial, because I, th I think in the most basic sense, some, a lot of people don't kind of understand why safety would be useful for healing or for therapeutic work or for change or transformation. Really simply, um, we as animals, when we feel threatened, we kind of shut down, we lock up, we become resistant, we are not compliant, right? Generally speaking. And so it makes sense if I want to move my own nervous system or help a person move their nervous system, there needs to be a degree of safety there in order for that to even be possible. Right. So that for me is the, I think of it as like the gateway into change is safety. It's mm -hmm. the key that unlocks that possibility. And so this is often for, with my clients where most of them are stuck. Most of them are stuck in some sort of internal conflict with themselves 
a lot of self-resistance, a lot of self-judgment, a lot of you know shame, uh, that kind of thing, guilt, that kind of thing, that creates conditions of not feeling safe, right? Or there, or something in their life around them isn't right and doesn't feel safe. And if we don't feel safe, again, we're you know it's it's hard to make change. So that's usually the first thing I'm looking at is supporting a person around um, understanding what it takes to create safety inside of themselves and help them start to have experiences of feeling safe. Oh, okay. A couple things to unpack here. So yeah. just, I'm going to, to take us one step back and say that what you're describing, um, this, this ch questioning kind of the basic assumptions and needing safety to, to, uh, I guess, prompt that self-writing instinct that we had talked about, mm -hmm. um, rumination and analyzing the problem does not count for either of these things. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and in fact, it almost seems to me that the rumination and then the, the, the constant somersaulting and trying to analyze and, and room and um, just researching and talking about the problem. It's, it's almost like this mechanism kind of just getting stuck in stage one. Like it's a car that's misfiring. Yeah. Like it can't mm. quite get started. Good metaphor. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that, would you would you agree with that that that's kind of where the that this idea of shaking someone's foundation up does not mean you're sitting around thinking about it and trying to find your way out of it and figure it out yeah agreed strong agreement um and and i i know that from firsthand experience because that was that was me for a long time was trying to understand what my problem was what the issue was and trying to learn, trying to self-educate to figure that out, which I know there's a lot of people out there who are in that same process. And I reached a point where I knew, you know, where I had the logical cognitive framework yeah. and understanding and answer, but my nervous system was still dysregulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so what I'm hearing then is safety is, it is, is, is what we need to actually make this process useful. So the, the thinking and analytical process is useful in the context of safety. Right. Yeah. And, and yes. And what I'm finding these days is, you know, creating a, a logical context and understanding of safety is usually kind of the, the missing thing for a lot of people. A lot of people don't realize, oh, I don't feel safe. Maybe I haven't felt safe for a long time. Uh, and I don't know how, what creates safety yes. and, in our, and, and in our culture, we tend to undervalue safety too. So there's a little bit of like a dismissal of that, of like, oh, it's not a big deal, or it's not really that important, or what does that have to do with healing or changing or fixing this? You know, I think people really, um, undervalue or under recognize the role of safety in as the key, again, that unlocks the ability to change. So tell tell me how how then do people create safety beyond saying I'm safe I'm safe I'm safe I, that doesn't seem to that doesn't seem to work out too well for people so so how so how did they do it what is, yeah what does safety right. mean right yeah it's a good question I mean well th those are two different questions okay how okay. do we do it and what does safety mean <laughs> okay so. start with how does safe, like what does safety mean and then how do we do it let's start with that what does safety mean um I think it's a felt sense of, um, I would say, uh, something ap approaching a, a center point between, you know, uh, dysregulation in the sense of dissociation and numbness and being spaced out or being overactivated and stressed and overwhelmed. When you, when you're safe, you feel present, alive in the moment, comfortable in your skin. Everything is okay enough, may not be perfect, but there's no perceived threat or um, looming, overwhelming thing, whether that's kind of a implicit thing in our life, like there's ongoing kind of chronic stress, or whether that's a, a like a, a literal physical threat, There's that's all gone. And we just feel kind of uh, center, you mm -hmm. know, that's how I think of it. Okay. So, so now you've told folks who are watching what that feels like, and many of them like ha have a have you ever either never felt that way or, or certainly don't feel that way now? Yeah. So if, if you, yeah. if you can explain the components, like what, what do people need to do to feel safe? How do we get there? That mm -hmm. would be tremendously mm -hmm. 
really helpful. Okay. So for a lot of people, this doesn't seem to make sense at first. And um, again, I arrived at what I'm about to say through first principles thinking. So um, this is what I'm about to say sounds a little therapy ish and a little maybe cheesy or cliche or uh, touchy feely and woo woo. Bring it I, on. But I promise <laughs> you, it's highly relevant. Okay. And so secure attachment and, and in specific secure relating as an ongoing skill is uh, I discovered the hard way, the long way that that's really at the center of the bullseye here in terms of what creates that felt sense of safety. Now, if we want to double click on, on all that, I can go into more detail about that, but I think that that's really the thing. And so it seems bizarre. Why would secure relating? Why would like the quality of my relationships be the thing that creates safety in my skin or not? Like, can't I create that on my own? Right. Um, which is a really deep question in a lot of ways, but I, I've really found that's really at the center of this. And I got there, like I said, because I saw a lot of, you know, I see a lot of people who want to, you know, work on themselves. They're trying to self heal. They're trying to figure it out. And I kind of coach people through that process a lot. I'm always helping to educate people on how do you do the self healing thing. Right. And, um, and I realized people are stuck with their own self relationship most of the time. And there's a lot of internal conflict, and a lot of stress and a lot of pain and a lot of frustration or a lot of fear. And that, that stuckness, that disconnect with ourselves, of course, is going to create stress in the body. Right. And of course, then we're not going to feel safe. Right. And so, yes, I, I, I was problem solving through why are people struggling to, you know, pick up these tools and, and progress with them. And that's really where a lot of people are stuck is what I found. So you just described two different things. And I want to point this out to people because mm. you use the word. Um, uh, actually, I don't know which word you use. And now I'm putting words in your mouth, <laughs> but basically secure attachment or secure relating. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned in your relationships, but now you just pivoted and, and spoke about relating to yourself. So I, I'm, I'm highlighting this for people if they, in case they didn't catch this. We're not just talking about secure relating to other people. We're talking about secure relating to yourself. Right. How do you treat yourself? Right. This is this is fundamentally why, and I know some of you don't like hearing this, um, but this is why so many people with neural circuit dizziness have these traits. We call them traits or personality, personality qualities that aren't really traits or personality qualities, they're ways of relating to yourself. So perfectionism, people pleasing, you know, being a really harsh critic of yourself, being super conscientious, those are ways of, of relating to yourself in a way that is not secure. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what Dave is talking about. Exactly, exactly, right, right. And just to highlight something you said there, which I thought was, was really interesting, is you know in the same way that i was saying earlier that healing is not a thing that you consume or that you get it's a process we tend to also make this generalization about personality right or, or traits like this is who i am and this is how i am you know because it seems like this enduring kind of pattern but what's inside of personality is a set of ways of relating like you're saying a set of worldviews, a set of uh, emotional patterns, a set of reaction response patterns, uh, a set of, you know, uh, projections that we put onto ourselves and onto others. And a lot of that is, I think, worth, you know, dealing with at the level of process as a, as a moving thing rather than as a static thing. Because if I go, this is my personality, this is how it is, it's static, you know, then I'm really missing a lot of opportunities to go, uh, is that useful? Is that healthy? Is that the only way I could do that? Et cetera, et cetera. And, and they're labile. I mean, it, yeah. again, a lot of these traits, oh, I've just been a perfectionist since I was five. I mean, not to say that you don't have some genetic in inclination toward a certain type of, of response, but a, a lot of this is learned and can be and can be modified. So Absolutely. it's much more useful to think about it in this way. Absolutely. So you you made an invitation to double click on some things. <laughs> so I'm okay. gonna double click on some things. Okay. So so diving a little more deeply then into into secure relating. Mm -hmm. So um 
just can you can you give me just a sense of what that does and doesn't look like like what what might the talk track be in someone's head how might they they, they talk about others or themselves when they're not relating to mm. others or themselves securely and how would it look different if they were doing that securely yeah good question um boy oh boy this is a topic i could go at length about so um i don't want to burn too much time or, or be too verbose about it but i think if we were to simplify it um, insecure relating at the extremes, you know, really uh, this correlates with attachment styles. So we have kind of anxious at one extreme, we have dismissive at the other, then we have the kind of fearful avoidant in the middle there, right? And so in terms of relating, there's, it gets very complex. And, you know, as, as I've been unpacking this with clients, there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance to relating, of course. Yeah. Hang on, I'm just going to clarify for people. So when we're talking about attachment styles, mm -hmm. uh, so we mean that you, you, most people have, again, a little bit of a, a proclivity toward or a, a pull toward relating in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And people who are uh, dismissive might be a little more likely to kind of pull back. Right. And people who are anxious are going to be a little more likely to, to kind of grab grab at you. Right. Um, and right. then there are people with kind of mixed styles or fearful mm -hmm. styles where they might do a little bit of both. And they, they, they seem to have less of a sense of this, this strategy always works for me. Mm. Um, so they tend to be a little bit less, um, a, a little, a little, a little less safe. They, they feel a little bit less safe. I'm, I'm really generalizing here, but I'm just trying to help people understand those attachment styles you mentioned. Thank you. So yeah. Thank so you. thank you. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt. No. So yes. Yeah. So, so what, so back to what, insecure attachment looks like and what secure attachment looks right. like. Right. So internally, if we're talking about mm -hmm. self-relationship again, mm -hmm. um, I think the way we can look at this a lot is with the kind of dismissive avoidance side of the spectrum that often looks like dismissing our own problems. Oh, that's not a big deal. Uh, I'll deal with that later. It could look like pro procrastination. It could look like, you know, minimizing. It could sometimes look like being really harsh and judgmental, but I think more often it's just yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to put that out of my out of my mind and keep going, right? So dismissing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other end of the spectrum, uh, I think with anxious attachment, we see a few different ways that that plays out. Sometimes that's, but generally it's boundary issues. It's not paying attention to my own boundaries, not being aware of someone else's boundaries, um, and or feeling like I need to reach in there, take control, make something happen that might be perhaps inappropriate um, or feeling like like really um, like the needs that I'm feeling, you know, justify whatever behavior. Right. So that's that's so all all, all of these approaches are well intended. There's mm -hmm. really like a lot of, you know, need and beauty and and depth to a person underneath that. But when we start relating in these ways as a, as a quality, especially with ourselves, um, it dysregulates us, it wounds us, right? Um, for me, what's, you know, often really helpful is to really understand what secure relating is and looks like. And please, and, and before you do that, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, because this popped in my head, yeah. as I'm, I'm trying to imagine what someone with chronic dizziness oh. often will, will will hear in this conversation. And I'm wondering where do the super conscientious people pleasers fall in here? So the people who are who are uh, I, really worried about other people's needs and feelings and dismissive mm -hmm. of their own. So mm -hmm. where where are they at? Yeah, good question. Um so I would say super conscientious people pleasers dismissive of their own um and and this is why i don't love attachment theory as, as the whole answer here it's just it's kind of a rough framework right. sure it's not as clear and detailed as maybe we we could use but um i i see both is the thing i see people pleasers who are very anxious and that's kind of a classic you're you're anxious attachment style tends towards codependency, right? Uh, and the uh, the dismissive kind of avoidant types tend towards uh, counter-dependency. I'm independent. I don't need you. I got this, that kind of a thing, right? Yep, got so it. So 
Um, That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So it really depends per person. Uh, sometimes though your kind of avoidance are very much, you know, people pleasers, right? And so, uh, so that could be dismissive of my own needs, but totally like tuned in to, to other your needs, needs, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I interrupted you before you could give us the, the goods here, um, which is what does secure relating look like? Like what, yeah. what what's that, what does that look like? Cause that sounds right. better than right. you know, what we're talking about right now. Right. And, 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 you know, to be clear when it comes to the kind of the online discussion about attachment theory and attachment secure relating, this is a thing I think is actually really absent. I think it's where really underdefined again, because therapy and psychology, the focus is on what's the problem, right? So we don't care a lot about what is healthy centered, you know, relating look like. I have my own take on it, partially informed, you know, on my studies, but also just my own observations. Um, I think a big piece of it, and this might sound a little weird at first, where I'm happy to explain it if it's not clear, is almost uh, what I would call a radical yes. Hmm. And what I mean by this is almost like uh, you may have heard like an improv acting where there's an improv exercise where um, whatever the person says and creates as a narrative that you're acting with, you say yes, and you add on to that, right? Now, if we import that over into relating, I think what that means is meeting whatever is happening either internally or externally with a big yes. So an, a deep acceptance of whatever's present already as what's here. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to like it. I don't have to buy into it, um, but I can meet it and engage it and work with it. Mm. Right. Yes. And you're, what you're describing is, is why I so often when people ask, okay, what do I, I think I need help with this? Where do I go? Mm -hmm. um, do I, do I see a therapist or what do I do? Um, I I'm, I'm always pushing people toward transformative modalities. So mm -hmm. I've used the word experiential, and I think that's important too to to get into your body, get out of your head. Uh, mm -hmm. So and I don't. We probably won't go into that too much today. But mm -hmm. this idea, if you're if you're going to see someone for help, that person shouldn't just be focused on the problem. They should also be focused on what's right. And that kind of brings us mm -hmm. back to some of the things we talked about earlier exactly. in this conversation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I think if we and that, that's a skill in and of itself, just developing, stretching our capacity to be like, okay, you know, and work with whatever's showing up, uh, external or internal, positive or negative, and meet that um, as a starting point, right? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a big part of secure relating. I think secure relating can look like um, validating whatever experience is happening, um, accepting, like I was just saying, um, uh, being kind, being compassionate, um, being aware of, of another's needs, the other's needs. So internally, this would be perhaps between different sides of ourselves, um, being aware of what the needs are and, and letting that be okay. Mm. Or, or being curious about those needs. Right. Yes. Uh, and perhaps like as a more deep underlying principle, connecting. Right. But connecting in a way that isn't breaking boundaries. Right. Yeah. You know, super easy. Just, you know, just connect, <laughs> but don't over connect. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and, and this is why it's a, it's a nuanced balance. Yeah, thing, right. It's hard. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a dance and it's a skill that we learn. But and this is one of the big one of my big things that I'm, I'll be saying as I move forward with my career as a coach is secure relating is a skill. It's a learnable skill. And the more we kind of map examples of that from the world that we see around us onto our own lives, onto our own relationships, it starts to get clearer and clearer. And it's a thing we do and we practice and we see and we feel the results. And we're probably going to waver from and mess up a bunch and kind of, you know, but as the more we do it, obviously the more natural, the more clear, the more easy it becomes. And, and then it just becomes this way of being ultimately. And to again, just bring it home, mm -hmm. safety, this creates safety Correct. and, and, and to bring that home for chronic symptoms, safety means no more symptoms. The right. symptoms will, will resolve themselves. So that's, that's why you should do this. Um, okay. So 
how do people start doing this? How? Yeah, right, right. It's a, it's, it's a good question. This is what I'm coaching people on a lot, especially when they're new clients. This is kind of that first tool I'm setting up because let's say a client comes to me and they have some like super deep trauma work to do, right? Generally a person like that doesn't feel safe in their skin, feels overwhelmed, feels stressed, has a lot of self-judgment or a lot of guilt or a lot of shame. And that's part of the package, right? And so the best thing I can do is set them up with something, a tool that gives them more safety in their skin off the bat, that gives them a way to relate to the shame, to the guilt, to the negative emotions, to the fear, uh, so that they can safely hold space and process that, right? Yes. So, so, so this becomes really pertinent to any deeper work that we want to do down the line, right? So long story short, it's an ongoing process to teach a person the feel for this, but really um, it's, it's about understanding, recognizing what secure rating relating looks like, which again, I'm happy to kind of explain in more detail, but, and then applying this with the different currents of emotion that pop up in us, right? So if I assume one way I think of this, so one metaphor I'm using a lot these days is almost like we have like a container self you know, and then we have, you know, parts or aspects of our personality, sides, emotions, or emotions, yeah, or narratives or mm -hmm. layers to our being, right? Mm -hmm. And if that container self is weak or underdeveloped or hard to access, uh, we're likely to get flooded with our emotions, hijacked, overwhelmed, this kind of a thing. So one one thing we need to do is start by building a really strong, robust container. And the relating is between our container self, and I'll explain what I mean by container in a moment here, between our container self and these currents of narrative and emotion and memory and what have you that we all have, right? And so, um, what, so, so that's where the relating is. It's between, and what I mean by container is a wise observer, a compassionate kind of still presence in us that is able to see and connect. You could think of it as an inner parent inside of ourselves, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but it's this wiser presence relating to whether it's the sad part of me, the victimized part of me, the angry part of me, the judgmental part of me, you know, and co-regulates kind of, or internally re regulates each of these. So that's, so what that looks like a lot is a client comes in, they're stuck with a narrative and they're like, God, I hate myself for this. Right. And I will, I will, I will encourage them to say and start relating to the part of themselves that, that is doing the hating in, in a secure way. And this is where that radical yes comes in because sometimes it's hard to be like, yes, to a part of me that hates myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's something, it might be something like, you know, I hear you. Tell me more. Oh, you hate this. What do you want from me? Yeah. Yeah. And what's important to you? Yeah. You know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And so we get curious, we get connected, but really the, the, the first move there is distancing ourselves enough to be able to relate. Yes. And, and this for, for just for, for clarity, it's it, it's, it's just a, a way of talking about it differently. Mm -hmm. So it, it's that simple. So mm -hmm. when you say, oh, I'm so angry, you just say to yourself, there's a part of me that's angry and go from there. Like you don't, exactly. you don't, it's there no like magical gymnastics you have to do here. It's just change the way that you're saying it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there's an I that's observing the angry part of me. And you may still feel like anger and meltdown or, or um, if you're, dealing with chronic dizziness, chances are it's not anger. It's something like a uh, fear, right? Mm -hmm. There is a part of me that is experiencing fear or that's holding fear. It's not, the fear isn't all I am. There's a me that's noticing the fear. And then, right. then there's, then there's this, this, uh, there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a relating that can be worked on once exactly. you've done that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And this is the, this is the weird thing. There's this kind of a reoccurring theme. We could go into like a whole philosophical thing that I don't necessarily want to like dump on your audience here, but it, the power is in the space between the objects here. 
right? And and it's, that's what relating is. It's this space between you and I where there's a process and a, and a circle that happens. And that's where so much of the capacity for change and transformation is. It's not in the, the object of my emotions or the object of my observer. It's in the, the connection, the space between the two. So well said. So um, again, just trying to frame this very simply for people. Mm -hmm. So what, what that might mean in the previous example, if you have fear of your symptoms, it would be not making the fear go away, not saying you don't have the right to be here. Stop. Yonit mm. says that if I'm not afraid of my symptoms, they'll go away. So go away. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that. Mm -hmm. It's making space for and welcoming the fear mm -hmm. from this, uh, creating this, sorry to use this word, but sacred relationship between mm -hmm. the observing you or the observer, the, the, mm -hmm. the inner parent, however you want to see it, and and the fear. And the, the transformation is there. Mm -hmm. That's, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that this is a, a big blind spot for a lot of people. But what's wild is when this gets put in place, almost, almost 10 out of 10 times that we start leveraging this with a client, I go, what are you noticing is happening in your body? Or how does it feel now? And they will be like, it feels lighter. It feels softer. I feel mm -hmm. calmer. You know, I get them doing this for a week, I have them report back to me. How's it been? Holy moly, my life is so different. I feel so much more relaxed. I feel so much more at ease. You know, it doesn't mean that everything goes away. It doesn't mean all the fear and stress and whatever is magically disappears right away. Often, the other shocker here is once these aspects of us start to get some connection and some relation there's a lot of beauty inside of them. There's a lot of amazing strengths, gifts, wisdom, um, values, important stuff, like juicy, beautiful, important stuff there. But it's just, we don't recognize it because it's wrapped up in a layer of angst or fear or, you know, what have you, depression or what have you. And so this is, you know, this is another big thing is people start to discover, wow, when I relate to myself, these aspects of myself can open up and let go of all of that, that they've been holding on to, and they can start to give me the gifts that they're carrying too. So it's a double advantage. So on one hand, exactly. we're, we're already creating safety through safe, through secure relating, right. but then you get more than just safety. You get, you get, I, I to use the word resources, but you get, you get life force, you get, you get energy that you didn't have access to before. Exactly. Yeah. More yeah. aliveness. Uh, some and sometimes profound emotions move that needed to move. And, and instead of that feeling daunting or uncomfortable, it feels profoundly right, which is really interesting too. Mm. All right. So thank you again for clarifying a little more about secure relating. Mm -hmm. So uh, coming back to the original question, which I asked, I don't even know how long ago, is there, are there any other major kind of non-negotiables that people need to have for healing? Or did we, we sum that up with safety and secure relating? Um, so like I said, I, th I think of safety and secure relating as kind of the gateway into change or healing, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's the prerequisite. Um, inside that gateway, once we've moved through that, assuming that's there, um, absolute needs no. Then, um, I mean, there are certain principles there, uh, major one being attunement and paying attention, curiosity, connection. Um, there are elements to healing, broadly speaking, you know, uh, there's problems and resources. So um, that may come into play. Um, but I don't personally think of it like, oh, there's absolutely things that need to be there. There are things that emerge. There are things that kind of show up. It's like, oh, there's some core beliefs here to address or, oh, there's a unresolved, you know, life experience that needs to be kind of cleaned up and, and, you know, settled that kind of a thing. So where we go when I'm with a client, it's really dependent on the person. Um, but you know, when, when I'm, th this is, this is, the, this, this is the complexity. So when I'm coaching people on how to self heal and they want to know, how do I find the problem? How do I, you know, figure out what happened? How do I resolve it? Right. Um, 
part of the thing is it takes a lot of curiosity. It takes a lot of really looking. It takes a lot of look uh, ability to look at it from different angles or let go of certain narratives or certain ideas. Um, and it, and I really think that a person's entire nervous system is already communicating whatever the problem is. Mm. So this is part of my training as a hypnotherapist. They say, they actually say communication is redundant, that verbal communication is redundant, that the body is already talking, the nervous system is already talking. So from my point of view, my job is to look and listen and get real curious. And if I see a pattern there, to follow that. That is so interesting. We're, we're going to get into that. I'm going to I'm okay. going to back up for one second and just yeah. say the elements that you mentioned. I, I maybe we don't necessarily have to call them non-negotiable, mm -hmm. but things like attunement and mindfulness. I mean, if you're going to try to securely self-relate, those are pretty important. So yeah, a takeaway for people, at, even at this point in the conversation is just working on that is going to help move you forward. So working on, when I say emotional um, mo emotional mindfulness or mindfulness in general, it's, it's noticing what's already here. How, how are you feeling? Like right. stopping and saying, what was that? And right. having, as you said, some curiosity about that. Huh, what was that? And then separating yourself from the experience a little bit so you can ask more questions and discover again, what the relationship is like between you and these experiences and how you might be able to adjust that by being curious. So again, just even at this point in the conversation, because we're, we're about to, to dive into some things that are, maybe are a little harder for people to do for themselves, they can mm -hmm. already start with the things that we talked about. Absolutely. And can I add a comment about what you just of said? Of course, there? please. Uh, so I, I, I want to just kind of self-disclose here. For the longest time, you know, I uh, I definitely have a woo-woo, open-minded side of me. I also have a very critical, skeptical side of me that, you know, sometimes I hear things from the therapy or the healing world and my eyes roll and I'm like, really? That's going to do it? <laughs> and honestly, this whole piece about mindfulness and this whole piece about attention and attunement for the longest time and even secure relating, if I'm going to be honest, I kind of would roll my eyes at it and I'm like, nah, that's, that's BS. Like no way, you know? Uh, and, and again, I arrived at the things I'm saying, the kind of the long way, you know, again, by, you know, really breaking down to, okay, what really needs to be here? And when I really wrap my head around the power of just curiosity and attention and how that plays into to feeling safe. And I we can even double click on that if you want. That's a whole, that's a whole long conversation too. But um there, there's a reason why that works. It's not just therapists being woo-woo or wanting to import Buddhism into therapy because they want to, you know, there's a reason for that. Right, right. And thank you. I appreciate you mentioning that. Um many people in my audience are going to appreciate you having this perspective um, and having arrived here anyway. And I, I think we've made, we've done a good job of making the case for why you should, mm -hmm. but, but, but why these particular tools, because they work, mm -hmm. because exactly. they work and, exactly. and sorry. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can feel free to roll your eyes while you do it. It's okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah. it. I'm really coming from a very practical frame at, at the right. bottom of this. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Yeah. Okay. So you just told me that the, the the nervous system is already communicating the problem and we just have to pay attention. So please uh, tell me more about that. Yeah, it's um, this was a huge eye opener for me. Um, mm -hmm. This is something they teach you uh, in hypnosis training pretty extensively and in different schools of hypnosis. Hypnosis is a very wide field with a lot of different schools of thought and different approaches. The style of hypnosis that I was trained in is what's called conversational hypnosis. So it's all real time live with the person. It's a conversation, right? Which means that I'm not working from a script and leading you through uh, like a prefabricated thing. I, I don't know, right? And so the, the whole reason that works is that the person's nervous system is already self-expressing the problem. Uh, 
And this is this is also a principle that's taught in somatic therapy. You know, so I've started to kind of cross train and learn different models of therapy. This is something they teach in somatic therapy. This is something they teach in some of the finer points of talk therapy. Even you know, is that the nervous system is self-expressive fundamentally by by its very nature. And so, if we hold that as a, as an idea, as a what if, like you don't even have to buy into that hundred percent for that to work. But if you hold that as like, hmm maybe there's something here, right? Maybe my nervous system's already speaking, it's already communicating. Um, then really our job is just to look at, well, what's the pattern here? What's the set, the sequence of things that show up re repetitively, you know? And so um, that's huge. If you can get that, get the, the sense of that, the shape of that, you'll, you, that you'll be a long way towards, towards healing. So how do people do that for themselves? Yeah. Because what they will, because I, I hear it already. They're saying, I've thought about this. I mean, they, hopefully they're not saying this. We, <laughs> we kind of talked about this earlier, but in case, in case you need us to remind you, um, thinking ex and obsessively ruminating about the problem is not what we're talking about. Right. right. So how do you, how do you do this? Good question. Okay. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent because it might be useful here and then I'll answer that. Um, okay. You know, you really have to look, you have to kind of zoom out from your cognitive problem solving, logical, rational, linear thinking, right? You have to, it's like looking at a piece of art where you have to sometimes step away from it a little bit and, and see the, the frame and the whole thing and the big picture of it and the flow of the piece from afar. You kind of have to be able to do that with yourself a bit. So you have to look at what are my patterns of behavior what are my patterns of response? What are my patterns of emotion? Um, you know, what's the sequence of events that my logic goes through when I'm on a, a particular narrative, right? And you, and and what are what's happening in my body while these things are happening, right? How and then and this gets into like lifestyle and you know how am I, you know, sleeping and how am I eating and actually all that. You know, it's it really is a holistic big picture that when you zoom out and you look at, you start to get the pattern, right? And and this is what we're looking for is what's the repetitive pattern here that's been communicated. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's mm -hmm. also, uh, okay, there, there, I was about to say something that I would do with clients that's hard to teach someone to do with themselves. Um, so what I would look for myself are what are habitual narratives that I keep coming back to? Core beliefs, thought loops. Those are going to be obvious, easy ones to catch if we can. The, the trick is not thinking through the thought loop, but looking at the thought loop, right? Noticing Mind, it. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness, noticing it, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be looking at patterns of sensation in my body, right? Repetitively. I would be looking at... Um, repetitive triggers, things I know upset me and trigger me, you know, and what's there. Cause sometimes they're not clear or sometimes it's really tempting to just externalize it, make it about the person, the thing, the situation, and you point the finger and not look at, well, okay, what's here, right? With that. So there is kind of a, almost a softening of our gaze. You know, it's like a, <laughs> here's a random reference. Do you remember those posters from the nineties where you kind of like step back and it looks like just a bunch of like random I, noise I know what you're talking about. Yes. And, and you unfocus your eyes and all of a sudden there's like a 3d thing that's supposed to emerge. Yes. I talk about those all the time. I'm so glad you <laughs> referenced that. <laughs> We're definitely dating ourselves here. Uh, just, but like optical illusions, right? right. So just, exactly. just optical illusions, but like they had them at the dentist's office or, right. or they had these books where right. you could, Yes, I know exactly what you're talking yes, about. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's it's that kind of a thing of, of letting yourself kind of unfocus a little bit, widen the scope of your attention and see what's here as a shape. And sometimes it's helpful, I think, to describe that shape or list the pieces that are present. Okay. If that makes sense. That's very abstract, I know. But Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna drill down. We're gonna make it concrete, damn it. Okay. So <laughs> great. So so let's just say we have uh, we have a, a a person who is just constantly ruminating on the symptoms mm -hmm. and just feeling really really awful mm -hmm. and 
um, just feels like life's a mess and I, I can't go back to work because I'm really stuck in these symptoms and there's just a lot of stress and tension. So what, what kinds of questions might you ask, again, while you're observing the person's body? What kinds of questions might help get you a sense of the shape of this pattern? Mm -hmm. I would actually start, so this is kind of like tracking. I would just start with feeding back what's there. So there's dizziness. That's a piece. There's rumination. Mm -hmm. I might even feed back exactly what that rumination is. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's this rumination about da, da da da. There's uh there's some tension, right? There is, you know, a, a sense of why can't I get better? Right. And just start to name the components of the experience that this person's having. And then unpack them. Right. And then unpack them. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yes. So, so just getting a sense of what those are. And then, you know, the next question is over time, right? So, you know, when did these happen? What happened just before these happened? You know, what's happening in life around this, right? Like, uh, you know, uh, when do they chill out? You know, when does the person's mind go a little calmer and quieter, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Right. And start to look for yeah. it. Yeah. So, I, I'm just noticing again, just as a, for, for people who are hearing this and they're like, okay, well, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to help me. Um, it It's going to help you even if you don't figure anything out because mm -hmm. it's very regulating to put names on your experiences, period. Exactly. So again, coming back to this big wide theme of safety, it is it creates safety in your nervous system to get a sense of what's there and for you to make a connection and a meaning out of it. Your brain ultimately is a meaning making machine. So when you put meaning on something, it's ah, okay. Right. Wow. That's right. what that is. Right. Totally. Yeah. And okay. So I, I can kind of close the loop here on all this and okay. help help Please. to make it make more sense. So from my point of view, and this is just one way of looking at, there's a lot of different ways we could look at this, but all of those pieces of, of the experience of the problem are self-expression. They are the nervous system automatically self-expressing. They are communications from the body, from the mind, from the you know limbic system, from the different layers of the brain. These are different communications of, of some pattern, right? Now, if, okay, so I, I didn't know if I wanna go here, but we're gonna double click on, on secure attachment and and what makes that work okay what's underneath secure attachment is a deep relationship between self-expression which is a natural thing our body does and attunement or attention and the relationship between the two and that goes all the way back to being a vulnerable infant who you know were born with what an instinct to cry in order to get fed you know soothed protected, right? So it goes all the way down to the roots of the nervous system to the to our first days here on, on earth, right? And so that's the foundation that the rest of our nervous system is built on, is this relationship between attunement and um, attunement and self-expression as a way to get co-regulation, to get safety signals from the world around us. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause you and just see if I, I can explain this. Um, in kind of from a different angle. So, okay. so self-expression, self-expression, what you're calling self-expression, just kind of to give a simple example, um, when I express an emotion, does someone notice and does it help me get my needs met mm -hmm. or is it, or does no one notice or it doesn't help me get my needs met? Mm -hmm. And then therefore that self-expression is either useful or helpful to me or it's not. The the issue being that, of course, the nervous system's drive is always is go, is to self express. So, in these early experiences, if we self express, for example, we cry and we scream when we're hungry, right? And the the caregiver responds with like, "Oh God, it's hungry again," right? And and it's not met with attunement, and it's not met with, "Oh, my needs got met when I did that thing." We may learn, or we will learn ultimately, that that kind of self expression doesn't lead to the outcome that we want. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. Just wanted, again, I just wanted to explain what you were saying and expand on it a little bit for people who don't, exactly. Uh, exactly. Who don't know. So, yeah. So this whole message seems a little abstract and bizarre, but if, if we, if we can all agree that the earliest experiences and, and kind of instincts of our nervous system is tr to try to get attention, to get fed or get our needs met, and that that's really at the base of our experience of relating 
right? Mm -hmm. We can agree with that. Um, then it follows that these are kind of natural threads throughout our life in terms of relating that correlate with an experience of safety. And so, so when we are paying attention to our nervous system and paying attention to the things it's expressing, whether it's body sensations or thought loops or emotions, what we are doing is we're kind of being both sides of that equation. We're mm -hmm. self-expressing and then we're bringing attention to it that says, hey, I'm here, I'm listening, and that creates a felt sense of safety. Right, right, and which is why it's so powerful then when you're doing this with someone else who mm -hmm. who can also again see that pattern and and attune to that pattern but you're saying people can also do this for themselves correct yeah, yeah. absolutely and and you know i think in a in a perfect world we have both mm -hmm. yeah of course in a perfect world we we do have both but i guess this brings me to the question then of how so let's say you've 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 started to muddle way, your way through some of this mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're like okay i got a bunch of problems and i don't and and okay i i'm kind of a jerk to myself so i guess i can start working on that mm -hmm. um how do you how do you know besides the self-relating um are there other problems that people should really be moving toward like if there's a big a big pattern someone's observing like wow besides like really being mean to myself in general i also really ruminate constantly about mm -hmm. how terrible my life is mm -hmm. so what kinds of tools would be helpful for them to start addressing that to un to, to unravel that a little bit more mm -hmm. yeah rumination uh, one of my favorites I, oh, i'm good yeah. i'm good at ruminating oh, good perfect great <laughs> <laughs> from one ruminator to another exactly all um, of you yes so yeah, um, I, I hate to be a broken record here, but really, like the 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 secure relating self regulation piece is is the real answer to that question. In my personal opinion, there are cognitive ways you can go to work with you know the thoughts that are probably also helpful and also useful. Um, but if there's if you notice rumination, it happens in the mind, but it's an impulse. It's not like we choose to ruminate. It's not like I'm gonna sit right. here and it's stew not a behavior. on behavior. Yeah. No, yeah, right. it's right. it is it is an unconscious impulse, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, okay, well, where's that impulse coming from? Again, it's coming from a drive to feel heard, seen, and connected to, right? There's something in me that wants to express and vent and think about and problem solve and sort through, right? And the assumption usually with ru rumination is when I know or when I understand, I'll feel better. Mm hmm. Right. Okay. So let's just say we mm -hmm. have someone trying to do really trying to do self healing. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Okay, I buy this so secure self relating can solve most of my problems. I got it. <laughs> um, but they're, they're kind of a long way off. Mm -hmm. so, so where does resourcing come in? Like what mm -hmm. is what is resourcing? And how can they start to use that to help arm them for this? particular growth that they're right. going to need to do. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Zooming way out. Okay. So we've been double clicking on secure relating and it's yes. important zooming way out. Okay. If we're looking at the big picture of relating, we can really simplify it down to a very basic equation, right? Which is that we have problems and we have resources and what transforms. And again, I'm about transformation here. What transforms problems is bringing resources to the problems. Like really, it's that simple from the most zoomed out level. Now, in practice, that gets very nuanced and, and there's a lot to that. But then the, the obvious thing there, if that's true, if that makes sense, if that's, you know, follows for other people, then we have to look at, do I have the resources in myself or in my life to be able to deal with these problems? Right. And a lot of people really don't feel like they do. But the, right. So, so what do we do? Right. So, and this for me is actually the kind of good news, fun side of therapy and transformation healing. It's actually really cool. It's funny how often I, though, I will bring this idea to clients and they kind of like look a little bummed or a little like, <laughs> but, but, 
But the answer then, of course, is to develop resources, right? And right. so th there's a whole, you know, we can talk about what is a resource in specific, what does that look like? We kind of talked about that earlier a little bit. But if we can develop our resource side of things and grow our capacity to feel resourced, um, have a wide variety of, of ways to be resourced, that's another big one too, that's going to equip us to way more skillfully deal with a problem. And it gives us a bit of security to know I'm not just stuck with, I'm not only stuck in my nervous system with a bunch of problems and no answers and a, but a bunch of terrible experiences, which if I'm going to be honest, that's mostly what I see in the world around us today is a lot of people who unfortunately are under resourced. It's like it's like it's it's almost like one arm is really strong and well developed, and the other arm is really weak. And like, and what they need to do is kind of beef up that other side, which is their resourcing side. I, I completely agree. Um, and again, as as not a psychotherapist, I mm -hmm. think I've I've observed in many in many situations, and this does not apply to all psychotherapists or all psychotherapy, but we're we're so focused on what's wrong. We're so focused on what the problem is that right. we're not, we're not, we're not necessarily giving people the best leg up toward right. solving the problems because they're starting from this. I, I wouldn't say they're starting from a weakened state. They're starting feeling like they're in a weakened state yeah, right. and it's our, the resources are there. We just need to find them. So I think it would be really helpful. You can explain what a resource state is if you think that would be useful, but I'd mm -hmm. also really like some very specific, concrete examples of what they are, because I think that will help people understand what we're yeah, talking about. Yeah, right. So, okay. So resources, okay. So just broadly speaking, I think we could say resources, anything that's um, helpful, empowering, makes you feel good, useful, um, strengthening, supportive, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this could be, um, this could be emotions. Like if you have a capacity for really big, positive emotion, like joy or gratitude, that's a very common one. Um, it could be things like mindsets, you know, like maybe someone's learned like a, something from the internet. That's like a really useful way of thinking about things. That could be a resource. It could be a natural skill we have or personality tendency. That's, that's helpful. Like kindness, patience, curiosity, playfulness, um, you know, persistence, these kinds of things. It could be, it can also be external. It could be a relationship. It could be, um, you know, it could be a set of memories from a better time in your life or mm -hmm. from an awesome vacation you took or, you know, the the somatic memory of laying in the sun on the beach, et cetera, et cetera. It can, it can be a direct nervous system experience as well, right? And so um, there are a lot of ways we can go with resourcing, you know, and it can be obviously abstract too. It can be meditation. It can be spiritual experiences, et cetera, et cetera. So um, all of that, from my point of view is, you know, people underestimate the power of these positive experiences. And I think that ties into like how the brain is designed and created and our neurology. We tend to kind of devalue these experiences, not access those memories or those feelings or those capacities often enough. And, um, and so we negativity bias. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly yeah. that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so we don't, we don't leverage them. I think we don't really understand how much we could leverage that to help with a problem. So a lot of times it doesn't occur to us to take a positive moment and bring that to the problems in our lives. So we usually use that as a form of escape. I want to get away from the problem and go have fun and play and feel good. And which is, this is all fair, you know, but there's an opportunity to take all of that good, amazing, positive experience and bring that back to, you know, whatever it is that needs healing. So con give me a concrete example of how someone, how someone like, like step one, mm -hmm. do this. Like if you can break it down like that, I know you're really good at doing this. So yeah. I would never, I wouldn't ask very many people how to, how to do this, but say someone is really afraid of symptoms mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to, to help someone bring a resource to that situation. So feel free to make up whatever you need to make up to make this work. Okay. So, so do you want the actual like four step recipe to transforming mm -hmm. a problem? Okay. Yeah, please. Oh my. 
Okay. Hell yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. yeah. One of the major, major trade secrets. This is one of my, <laughs> my favorite things to share. And this is Wonderful. really, this ties into a field of neuroscience uh, called memory reconsolidation, which is kind of yes. referenced in a lot of therapy modalities, but kind of underplayed, quite underplayed frankly, from big what time. I see. Yeah. Um, and so, so the basic idea there, of course, is that first we have to light up a little bit of the neural circuitry of the issue of the problem uh, so that it's alive in our body so that uh, as a felt experience, we can connect the resource to it, right? So it has to we, be- We there. need that neural circuit on. Right. If it's not right. on, nothing's going to happen to it. Exactly. Yeah. From there, we need enough safe distance to be able to access a different way of feeling for a moment, right? So there's a lot of different techniques to get a little bit of space from the problem. Um, and you can kind of pick your favorite of the many, right? Um, from there, we want to access a resource. And this is why building up a resource is so important because if I go to that next step, so the second step is get space, third step is access a resource. What is that third, you know, what is that resource? Do I have something there that I can like a memory or a mindset or something? Um, and then once I've really got that loaded up, I can really, really remember how it feels to be laying in the sun, you know, and feeling totally safe and feeling wonderful. From that place, when I'm feeling that, I bring my attention back to the symptom or the fear underlying the symptom and, and think about and bring my attention to the symptom from this place of feeling resourced. Mm -hmm. So where people tend to struggle the most in these four steps, is allowing themselves to go there with the resource. Really? That's yeah. so interesting to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to get even more concrete here. Let's go. So, yeah. So, so uh, for example, someone is, oh my God, full of dread and fear. I can't go to the grocery store. The, mm -hmm. I'm going to go down the grocery aisle and it's going to be horrible and mm -hmm. they can feel the fear in their body. So they might do some, so there's, as you said, there are so many different ways to do this, but a, a very simple way would be to get distance by watching yourself do go through this experience. Say you're like, you're watching yourself on a TV screen and you have the remote control, for example, right? right? Yes, totally. So now you, you got a little distance. You're kind of like one foot in one foot out. Mm -hmm. You're seeing yourself getting really freaked out by the grocery store. But you and you can kind of feel that, but you're also not in it as mm -hmm. much anymore. And then you would divert your attention to, as you said, say something that feels really lovely, something, uh, some fond memory that you have, mm -hmm. like you said, lying on the beach. And you'd you'd really try to get into that experience. You try to feel that mm -hmm. fully in your body. Mm -hmm. Just allow that that to wash wash over you from head to toe. Maybe spend some time naming like what am i feeling and where so exactly. really creating a map a strong map a strong experience of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you bring the two together yeah. so you come back into this room where you're watching the tv but with you and you bring with you that imprint that map of what mm -hmm. it feels like to feel good right right exactly and sometimes i phrase that as you know step back into the scene with the tv bringing this full feeling of laying there in the sun with you and feel, notice how that feels now, something like that. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. So now, now Dave, mm -hmm. how do we differentiate this from bypassing? Because yeah. I am, I I'm constantly trying to explain this to people uh, that we, we, do, we can't just ignore problems. There are, there are, there are problems and we do have to work on them. So, um, just imagining feeling good is not is not the only part of this that's important. So how mm -hmm. do we not bypass? Mm -hmm. I, I love that you're asking this question. It's such an important question. Um, and it took me a little while, honestly, to like decode and wrap my head around what's the difference that makes the difference here, right? Um, I think there's really two things um, that that separate bypassing from using a positive experience for transformation. One is, is there avoidance going on, right? And this goes back to, again, that radical yes of secure relating, you know, allowing whatever's there to be there, um, 
you know, understanding that if I have fear or stress, that I have fear and stress and that it's there and I and can accepting really, it, accepting it as a, as a presence. I don't have to. Right. You know, passive Not like me. passive. Okay. So, so for example, to coming back to our TV screen, mm -hmm. you would first have to be okay with the fact that you are afraid of going to the grocery store. Right. And then this works. So yes. you don't just say, okay, I'm terrified of going to the grocery store. I don't accept that. That's not really happening. Okay. Okay. I'm exactly. going to do this thing that you needed. Dave talked about it. It's going to work. No, you first have to be really be there for yourself in that experience and, and, and accept that, that this is where you're at. Mm -hmm. We we have a term for this, Dave, in the field. Um, we call it outcome independence. And it's, it's a word that's a little tricky because obviously we know why people are here. The outcome they want is to not feel like crap. So mm -hmm. total outcome independence is not going to happen. But what we mean is outcome independence in the moment enough for you to really be there with yourself and for yourself when right. you're going through something hard. So again, just clarifying. Okay. Thank you for letting me divert back to that. So one thing you're just saying is this secure relating the radical yes. So mm -hmm. that's one component that prevents us from, or that that determines that we're not really bypassing. And the second thing that I interrupted you before you could say. Yeah, I mean, and then the second thing is literally that fourth step of those four steps, which is connecting the dots between the resource and the problem, right? So from my point of view, what defines um, bypassing in all its various flavors or escapism or hedonism or, or anything like that is when we are seeking some sort of a resource state, a positive experience, but then we, it's kind of, it's like we go up, we go down, and then we don't do anything with it. We just, it's just a way out of the problem for a little while. It's a little relief, which fair enough. We all deserve pressure off from our problems for a little while. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if we're, if I'm just going up and going down, then cool. I had a nice experience, but it just fades off into memory, right? And that's true no matter what that kind of resource or positive experience is. What defines transformation is the bringing of that to the problem. So you have to be willing to accept that there's a problem there. You have to be self-honest about that and comfortable enough to just be like, that's here in me. You know, I don't have to like it. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to want to keep it, but I, but it's here, right? And then, because you can't change something you won't look at or don't see. It's that simple, right? And right. then you have and then you have to, you know, uh bring some sort of resource to it. So that's really the difference. When I look at, for example, spiritual bypassing in the new age community, generally what we're seeing is people who are just chasing resource state after resource experience after resource state, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. And there's total avoidance and there's no connecting the dots between the two. Right. Uh, which is fair enough. If that's, yeah, I was there, I get it. I, I understand what that, that process is like. Um, but that's why those, that's why someone can, you know, have a, a, go to a meditation retreat for 10 days and have this profound experience and it's super beautiful. And, and then they kind of come back and they still have the patterns of depression or anxiety, or they still have the, what have you. Mm, okay. So I guess that is a perfect tee up for me to ask questions about transpersonal approaches. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and I know that we're running relatively short on time. So I know we're not as much as I would love to talk about transpersonal approaches for the next couple hours, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to keep it relatively brief, Okay. but so, so, and, and as she says that she asks an enormous question. Mm -hmm. So where does transpersonalism fit into this healing process? So right. maybe, maybe in, you can, answer this question in the context of everything that we just talked about. So mm -hmm. secure relating, mm -hmm. resourcing, mm -hmm. uh, making space for the problem. Mm -hmm. Where does transpersonalism, where does spirituality fit into this equation? Right. Uh, I think the, the real short answer there is that I don't think there's a larger resource state you could experience than transpersonal, than a good transpersonal experience than a profound transpersonal experience. I think it is the deepest biggest, most robust nervous system learning you could possibly have. Mm -hmm. And with that in your corner, that obviously is going to arm you to be able to deal with all kinds of stuff in a way that nothing else will. I think it's that simple. So I've observed, Dave, and I'd like to hear 
if you think this gets at what you just said, mm -hmm. um, people who have a strong sense of spirituality seem to get better faster. Mm. And I'm not saying that that's, this is not, this is a huge generalization for those of you out there who are total, you know, anti uh, spiritual people. It's totally fine. We can be totally rational. We can talk neuroscience all day. Um, but it seems like there's something to, I, I had always kind of attributed it to this ability to surrender on a deeper level or accept, or like, it's not all my problem. I, I, I don't know what it is, but it seems that some, again, people with some kind of spiritual inclination mm -hmm. have, like you said, more, some kind of re extra resource, resource that helps them get out of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So has that been your experience in, um, in your work? Yes. Yeah. Generally, you know, I, I think in a perfect world, if a person comes to me and they're like, I have problems, but I have this huge background of meditation and psychedelics and spiritual practice. And they're really familiar with these big, you know, kind of ecstatic states. Um, then it's really easy to like put two and two together with that person and kind of help mm -hmm. them create a transformation, right? So, mm -hmm. because they're already super resourced from my point of view. So I would agree with that. Um, I think there's a lot of things we could look at as to why that's the case. Uh, one way of looking at this, you know, if you look at the, the current research on psilocybin therapy, you know, uh, I think this is Roland Griffith's work. He mentions how uh, people who have mystical experiences, which is a robust, profound, transcendent experience, um, tend to have better mental health outcomes across the board with psilocybin therapy. So less depression for longer, less anxiety for longer, um, better results in general. Um, so there's science that, that kind of backs up what we're saying here. Uh, I think we could also just think of it kind of very logically that problems have a definition. They have boundaries. They have a shape and a contour and a set of criteria that defines having a having a problem, right? Now, if you have an experience that's vastly larger than the problem, right? Just by, you know, comparison and by scope of your attention, that problem now seems much smaller because you know you're capable of feeling so much more and accessing so much more than whatever that is. And, and so I think that's another way of thinking about this is that you want to, you, and so another metaphor I use a lot with my clients, and this kind of ties in well, is that we're, I'm teaching them range of motion in their nervous system, that they've lost some range of motion. And what we're working at is really stretching that range of motion. So that full flexibility, Right. And, and to me, th this might be one descriptor of what is health or healing is regaining flexibility in the nervous system. Um, and I think mystical experiences are kind of or, or large, you know, transcendent, transpersonal experiences are one kind of extreme of that range of emotion, you know, a range of range of motion rather. And so um, I think that's valuable. I think it's it's valid just, you know, in that sense. You know that it gives you it gives you a bigger palette that you're I working. completely agree. And and translating this again to into very simple language, um, if you have some way to gain perspective on the dizziness in the context of everything that is, the bigger your definition of everything that is, the smaller mm -hmm. the dizziness is going to seem. Exactly. And and we are by no means I, that I started this segment of the conversation talking about bypassing. So we're not talking, oh, the dizziness is no big deal. And you should just like, you know, give it away to the universe. And no, that's not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. But it's one very potent resource that does seem to help people. It's not the only work anyone has to do. As you said, when people mm -hmm. just bypass endlessly, they're not really necessarily getting at the problem. And you, you mentioned for you th mm -hmm. that that was true. Right. So we're not saying that, but but I, that's something to think about because I know I have a very diverse audience out there. I know there are some of you who are, who are very religious, who are very spiritual and, and some people who are, who are very much not spiritual and, and everywhere in between. But I, I encourage you, if you have any inclination towards spirituality to think about what, what we just talked about, how, how it can put this in context again, not for the sake of saying, oh, it's no big deal, but for the sake of 
of of making you feel like there's a little more to you than mm. just the problem. Right. I think in general, that's a really important piece. Starting to, and, and it's often already true, but it's a, this like this thing that people kind of delete out of their conception of the problem or their current self or whatever's going on. We forget all the other experiences we've had that have beauty or depth or meaning or validity in the, in the, larger scope of our life, right? So we delete out a lot of these memories and relationships and periods of our life for, you know, things we've experienced, lessons we've learned, things like that. And I think it's really important to, to reclaim all of that. And remember, I am so much more than this moment and the things I'm dealing with or struggling with. I'm this much vaster, you know, being and presence. And, and I know those words sound very woo woo, but, um, we saved them till the end of the conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. But, but, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's really true. Like just experientially, just obviously, you know, like I have memories that stretch, you know, the entire course of my life. Of course I have experiences that are outside of whatever my current challenges are. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, for framing that for us. This has been so enjoyable for me personally. I nerded out here, uh, but I think I don't even know if I can list all the takeaways. I, I this was just fantastic, and I know all of you out there listening are going to get so much from this. So please let me know what you think. Tell me your questions. Give me your comments. Leave them below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to this as a podcast. Jump on YouTube and join the conversation in the comments because I think this is going to be, again, a really interesting discussion with, with all of you. Um, also, if you could please like this video, please share it. Please subscribe to my channel if you're on YouTube or if you're on a podcast here. You can rate me. You could give me five stars if you like the podcast. You can follow the podcast. All of these things help us reach more people. Dave, it has been an absolute privilege. Thank you so much. And you can hang out when I stop recording. But for the rest of you, um, I will see you soon. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hey, everyone. Before you go, I wanted to give you a quick summary of the key takeaways from this conversation. This is one of my most ambitious interviews, and I want to make sure that you really catch the most important things that we talked about today. Keep in mind, if you are watching this on YouTube, that our conversation is timestamped, so you can always go back and review any sections that you want to hear again. Now, key point number one is this idea that your nervous system has a self-writing instinct. There's this false idea out there that in order to recover from chronic dizziness, you need to strong arm your brain into being balanced again. And this is the focus of some neuroplasticity programs. Now, I'm not saying that changing your reaction to symptoms is bad or visualizing not being dizzy is bad, but when that's the approach that you're taking, you are giving your brain the signal that the symptoms are a problem. Instead, it's really helpful to reframe this by saying, my brain wants to be balanced. What do I need to do to get out of its way? Keep in mind that neuroplasticity and this self-writing instinct is something that your brain does naturally and easily all the time. So again, it's better and more effective for you to think of it like harnessing that process by getting out of its way than needing to strong arm your brain into doing something different. And this brings me to key takeaway number two, that the best conditions under which to do this are conditions of safety. And we defined safety in this interview as secure relating to yourself and others. In other words, the way that you treat yourself, relate to your own experiences, emotions, and problems is going to be a key and fundamental component of creating safety in your nervous system so that your brain, again, can do what it naturally wants to do, which is to self-write. And the third takeaway here was that we also emphasize the role of resourcing. So it's not just a matter of finding the problems that are keeping you here. It's also a matter of finding what's already working, what's already right, and strategically using those things, those components of your life as ways of counteracting some of the problems. 
And in this interview, we reviewed very, very concretely how you can do this for yourself. And finally, we touched on transpersonal and spiritual experiences and how those can also help people not just put dizziness in perspective, but to also have that biggest possible resource that helps counteract some of the problems that they are experiencing. So again, I hope you enjoyed this interview. And one other thing I wanted to say was that Dave does have his own YouTube channel. If you're interested in psychedelic assisted therapy or really just self growth and healing at all, you should definitely check out his channel, Integrative Psychonautics. And I will put the link to his channel below as well as his contact information if you're interested in pursuing coaching with him. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Take care. <music>